Good everything, Nubians. Hey, what is up? What's good wherever you are? Hello, greetings. And Dr. Carr, yes. what's where are you? <laughs> where in the world? Like Waldo. I am in a safe space that is even safer today, thanks to Clarence Tom. Salute, brother. So oh, all right. We drinking of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. drink to that. Not too far from Penn Point, Georgia, where he was born and raised and raised in Savannah. I am in the state of Georgia. In fact, if memory serves me correctly, the college I'm at right now was actually started in Savannah and then moved to Atlanta. And that, of course, is uh, the college that bears the name of Henry Morehouse. Yeah, I, I thought that hall looked familiar. I actually did a... Um a voter registration drive and we did me, uh, Sway Calloway and Joe Madison were on the stage. And I, I thought that looked familiar. I was like, that yeah. looks familiar. This is your spot. That's right. That's right. Your tour. Hey, look, this is a beautiful time to fight. Let's fight these people to the right. death. I say to the death. Yes. Uh, so yeah. Dr. Carr, are we in the F around or the find out portion of, of the, of the game? Well, we've been the F, we've been in the F around round for the last five hundred years, <laughs> but uh, and they've been in the find out range for about the same time. But this is another wonderful F around and find out. Although it's uh, it's a little bittersweet. I'm not sure. It's going to take our people a long time. But I should say one more thing about this hall, of course, where you all, you know, did that very important work, and where I'm sitting right now. This is, of course, Sale Hall. Sale Hall was for many years the main assembly hall, which is of course why y'all were here in here at Morehouse. This is where, right here, in these rows of chairs, young Martin Luther King would hear from that podium right there, Benjamin Mays. Mm. And uh, of course, Benjamin and Sadie Mays are, are buried right there outside of Sale Hall, right up the hill, as you know, that's where Morehouse's commencement is. To the right, of course, is Spelman College. Going past Morehouse is Morris Brown, the original Atlanta University, and the international the denomination, the theological denominational seminary is right down the street. And of course, behind here, if I went that way and crossed a little bit to the left, is the great Clark Atlanta University. So uh, the Atlanta University Center, which got a little bit more important today as a result of SFFA, uh, so Student Spirit Mission. <laughs> some of you will see this on Saturday, uh, but this is literally hours ago, the Supreme Court uh, handed out the decision that we knew would happen to overturn affirmative action. So a year ago this month, it was Roe v. Wade. So they are, they are doing exactly what those, those three, um, uh, I don't know what to call them. They're not people. Uh, those three plants, they were planted. They were put there to do exactly what they have done. I feel like there's an opportunity because ain't a damn thing we could do about it right now, right? So I'm not going to be in them streets. Well, some people should be in the streets. I think we should do all of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not somebody that's going to sit and complain. I'm going to make you pay for the dumb things that you do, right? So I feel like this is an opportunity for those of us that have the wherewithal to let them know what it looks like to deny opportunities to people who look like us. You are going to feel the pain, not us. Not us, if we do what we're supposed to do. I don't know how you feel about that, though, Dr. Carr. Uh, you know, I have a, I have a my, my, my perspective is colored by my experience. Like yours is, all of our, all of our experiences. Um, you know, born and raised in the post-apartheid South, the post-legal apartheid the customs were still firmly in place by parents who were born and raised in the legal apartheid South, um, in a black community, in basically that first and a half generation to be bust, uh, you know, born in 1965, started kindergarten in 1970, and in 1971 got on school buses as did black children all over the country. So I went to school in racially mixed schools while I lived in pretty much racially homogenous neighborhoods and churches and social formations. Um, so I saw those racial conflicts and experienced them up close. White teachers, some of whom were just true human beings trying to do their job to the best of their ability, making sense of something that they hadn't had to deal with in the same way. And some who were pure clan, and I celebrate uh, as my mother used to call them, them old diehards. They died hard. Um, 
and we, we helped to kill them, kill their spirits, kill their ambitions to crush our spirits. And uh, when we would drive one or more of them crazy in elementary school, or junior high school, or high school, we would celebrate their demises, not their physical demises, but the end of their sanity. So shout out to them too. So I, I lived through all that. And then I went to a historically black school, uh, Tennessee State. We played Morris Brown right over there across the stadium, which of course Nick Cannon and Charles Stone and all them made famous in Drumline. That stadium's still over there. And uh, so I know the HBCU experience very well, particularly the public HBCU. And then I went off to law school at the Ohio State University at that time, the largest university in the country. And so I know what it looks like to be regarded as an admittee. Never mind my grade point average, never mind my accomplishments in college. My presence, along with the 18, I think it was, out of 250 or however many entering first year law students at Ohio State University, my, my, our presence was considered an act of charity, regardless of our academic performance. It didn't matter. Our presence must be because of affirmative action. Um, we were there, at least I was there, invited to apply by a man we've talked about before, the great Frank Hale, former president of Oakwood College in neighboring Alabama here, Seventh Day Adventist School, who was recruited by Ohio State University to set up uh, what was then called diversity, uh, minority affairs during the 1970s and 80s. And so they recruited the top five students from each historically black college to come to Ohio State and consider applying to their graduate and professional school. So as I looked at some of my hill, Billy, classmates, and some who were quite fine human beings, I didn't look at them as peers. I didn't look at them as competition. I looked at them as people sitting next to me in class because I had come from a black foundation and I didn't look to white people then or now for my humanity. I understand as I'm reading this, these 230 pages of Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard versus University of North Carolina, billionaire clan adjacent racist Ed Bloom, the attitude of Clarence Thomas, because I got an echo of that coming up. Go ahead, Proud, jump in. I, I, I didn't jump in. Your internet went out briefly, but- um, Oh, are we back? Where yeah, that? yeah, no, yeah, you popped in and pop, popped out. Um, it's probably Clarence Thomas's ancestors. Not strong enough to stop us, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, that was y'all's best punch, but my mom and them blocked that punch and then gave you a little put up in your ancestral asses. I'm sorry about that. Not really, but go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was just, my, my dad went to um, Allen in South Carolina, yes. uh, where his cousin was the music director, because he couldn't get in Seton Hall, which was down the street from where he lived, because he was black. And I think about the fury, because he talked about it, you know, the fury. And my mother actually called me before this. My mother just called me. And she said, she? Yeah, she said, you remember? Because my, my brother um, has godparents who went to Brown. This is when they were, you know, integrating. And they were like, well, um, she's not, she, I was applying to college. She needs to apply to Brown and Princeton because she's not going to make anything of herself if she doesn't go to one of these schools. And she said, you remember that? You remember when they said that? And, um, you know, <laughs> needless, needless to say, you know, um, you know okay. I, I, I'm all right. I'm all right. You're doing all right. You know? You're doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> but this is the thing, you know, we have been conditioned to believe that if we don't go through these places, we will never be fill in the blank. But the reality is, is our fortitude and sometimes even the slights that give us the fuel. Because I know my daddy was fueled by not getting in the Seton Hall. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. And, yes. And, and his business that was thriving was right down the street, too, in Newark, you know, from Seton Hall. Because <laughs> you go down that South Orange Avenue, you're going to run into Newark uh, a few blocks. And I think about the countless numbers of black folk who didn't have an option but to go to a black school. But then I also think, you know, there's Carter G. Woodson, there was W.B. Du Bois, there was Ed Boucher. Like, we've always had Black folk go to Ivy League schools, you know, and it was an affirmative action then. Did Charles Bloxon experience affirmative action? Like, I feel like... Well, Charles Bloxon, uh, Charles Bloxon was a, an elite class athlete. He went to the Pennsylvania State University, not because they knew he was a bibliophile and a brilliant uh, scholar. He went to Pennsylvania State University because he was known as the blockbuster and would run over a defensive line. And that is true of still all these athletes. So there's no affirmative action on the sports fields. No matter right. that, exactly right. Paul Robeson, I'm no saying if, 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 if you have it, you're going to, 
and again, to me, I think it's an opportunity to examine what are you really getting? And if it's networking, if that's the most important thing, then it is up to us to start to build a network because the network didn't come out the ground. It was for, for, fomented and forged and formed and created and cultivated over hundreds of years with, you know, storied uh, mythology and Ivy League and people coming together on these campuses with a purpose. So if you're at a Morehouse or if you're at a Howard or a Hampton or, 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 uh, just name, fill in the blank, North Carolina, T, Florida Memorial, wherever you are, you know, make it your business not to just party and BS, but to create formations on these campuses that will then turn into networks, that will then turn into superpowers. And Dr. Black and I... Sorry. Yeah, they trying. They trying. I think there's an opportunity more than anything because they've done this thing now. So the question will be, what what is our response? Well, I mean, that's, that is the question, Prof. And I'll tell you, I, uh, I'm i glad, a couple of things. I'm glad that you, I'm glad your mom called you today. And I'm glad that she evoked those memories, not only of your father, your brother, your family. It reminds me of, sometimes I tell my law students, I say, you know, while we fight for reparations, our indigenous kin, are taking their reparations one nickel slot at a time. I'm sure that some of those Theden Hall students came into your store and bought things. And so y'all, y'all were taking y'all reparations one dollar candy at a time. <laughs> I, mean, I love the idea of black self-determination. This I share with Clarence Thomas, a man who has been ruined, quite frankly, by white supremacy, a man who worships whiteness so deeply that his response to it is a black nationalism that he can't recognize has uh, rendered him a figment of the white imagination every night in his bed, every day in his chambers, every trip that he takes on yachts and private jets, every uh, imagination that he will never return to the indignity of coming from Gullah Geechee, Geechee land where somehow he is less than human. Plenty of times to understand that he is a black nationalist, but his black nationalism is born out of a blackness that is a figment of the white imagination. I understand it, how W.E.B. Du Bois who worked in Fountain Hall, right beyond this building right here. In some ways, this is a magical place. How how Dr. Du Bois could write of Carter Woodson in April 1950 that the life of Carter G. Woodson, who died in Washington in April 1950, shows what race prejudice can do to a human soul and also what it is powerless to prevent. Think about the opportunities that we've had that we've turned our backs on. I started this morning, Prof, and I'm wearing very proudly one of the shirts of the great Martin Luther King Center that celebrated 55 years on the 26th of June. Uh, It's 55th anniversary. Uh, Back in April on uh, August Wilson, Hubert Henry Harrison, my Coretta Scott King birthday. On Coretta Scott King's birthday, she'd been 95. They unveiled a beautiful uh, monument to her right across from the crypt where Martin and Coretta's mortal remains are on the campus. They call it, as you know, they call that whole complex, the King Center campus. Um, So I I was, I spent most of the day on Auburn Avenue yesterday, WERD, the black radio station, um, the King Center, the King home. Shout out to all the wonderful National Park Service Rangers, all the brothers and sisters, my man from Detroit who was in the the sanctuary at the old Ebenezer across the street, as you know, from the Ebenezer where Reverend Senator Warnock um, holds forth. And shout out to that brother, because we sat, we, we sat there for a long time talking about preachers, C.L. Franklin in Detroit, Martin Luther King Sr. and A.D. Williams, and Willis Williams, and all the, the preachers in Martin King's line there as we stood in Ebenezer. Shout, shout out to the sisters who run the gift shops and bookstores who, uh, had long conversations with one sister from Cincinnati who's been there for a very long time. I mean, to elders, it was just good to see all those black people. Shout out to all the children, because I had my freedom schools meeting yesterday, every Wednesday, it's a standing in Bondi. And so I I did it remotely from there. And as I was doing it, I did it deliberately outside, all the students coming by from Chicago and from Memphis and all these other students, as I was having conversation around the book we're reading this summer, Stayed on Freedom. Uh, the story of Zahara and Michael Simmons, freedom fighters from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, whose headquarters is right, by the way, down this street, right off, of, right up behind Martin Luther King. Um, 
avenue. But shout out to all those students I got to see yesterday while I was with uh, our students, Center for Black Educated Development. But um, I started to do today from there. But SFFA came down. And then I had a choice between two places I might set up. One was here, which was the obvious choice, because I had been here too a couple of days ago, spent a lot of time on this campus. Shout out to um, Daniel Taylor, the director of the Clark Atlanta University uh, Museum, Art Museum. I went to see the beautiful Robert Woodruff murals, uh, newly restored this year uh, on the second floor of the administration building at Clark. Um, so shout out to her, got a chance to spend time with her and sit with her. She's a scholar of literature, African-American literature who's now the director of the museum. So, you know, just, just very powerful to sit there in, in our art and have this conversation. So I had a choice I said, well, you know, when SFFA came down, because the choice I made was to come here instead of going to another place. And that is a place that perhaps looks like, looks like what SFFA is powerless to prevent, a big public, university that is broadly non-white but has a plurality of white students but not nearly a majority that has a ton of resources that is hardwired into the lifeblood of the city and the region and that provides for students the type of educational experience that will allow them to improve their lives and the lives of their families. Could you guess what that institution is, Professor Hunter, here in the Atlanta metro area? In fact, downtown Atlanta, it takes up, a, it's got a big footprint, big and big and expanded. Hint, it's not any of the schools of Atlanta University Center, but it is the school that graduates the largest number of African-American undergraduate degree holders year after year. Please tell us. It's Georgia State. Georgia State graduates more black folk than it and has for years. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, because it's bigger. Georgia State undergrad population is a little over 30,000 students. Uh, close to 40% of those students are of African descent. Um, so you're talking about a, a school that is positioned in the state of Georgia to do that. Um, their, their so-called Latinx, however you want to define Latino population, is around between like 10 and a half to 11 percent. The so-called Asian population is inching toward 13 percent. And the white population is just south of 25 percent. It looks like the world. Hey, note to white Americans. Hey, Ron, Puffer. Hey, baby. You can say what you want about the 11th Amendment, but... Uh, we ain't having babies fast enough. It's over. It's over. It's over. It's over, baby. It's over. It's nothing you can do. It's nothing you can do. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who if I suppose I got quiet, I can hear her bleats somewhere around this region. It's over. It's over, Macho Man Savage. You can't wrestle your way out of this with rhetoric. And on the way out the door, take your little friend from Colorado. I know y'all be fighting because y'all think it's real housewives of the federal legislature. But either way, it's over. Georgia State University looks a lot like the country. It looks a lot like the U.S. South. The demographics are overwhelmingly non-white. Now, yeah, the SFFA opinion just came out. And if you're watching this on Saturday, we've had time to read it and digest it. And so, but as of this tape and everybody in Nubia were doing this live, it's been out for a little bit over an hour. Angie Porter texted me and sent me the copy and I was already reading it. So. Um, you know, Clarence Thomas wrote a concurrence, as we would expect. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a delicious concurrence. It's only about 38 pages. Uh, John Roberts wrote the majority, 40-page majority. Uh, the longest writing was Sonia Sotomayor. Sotomayor's uh, dissent was about 70 pages, 69 pages. And Katanji Brown Jackson, eloquent as in her short career on the Supreme Court always so far um, that I could just I kind of skim. So now I get to go line by line and read it and get out. This, uh, there are two, um, she had to recuse herself from the one with Harvard because of her relationship. Well, did she, did she, did she press on? Well, it says six to two. They said she, um, I was reading that, they, that she recused herself 
He did of her, it. But that doesn't preclude her from writing a dissent? Professor Hunter, you parsed that language beautifully. You said it casually, but everybody in Nubians listen very carefully. And everybody on YouTube listening to this, the thousands more who will listen to this old article, listen very carefully to what Professor Hunter said. At first she said she had to recuse herself, and then you followed it up with she recused herself. There's a difference between the two. Yacht riders and plane riders like Alito and Thomas don't ever recuse themselves. Kataji Brown Jackson didn't have to recuse herself if she's following the precedent of those two criminals on the other side. But as you said, she recused herself. Why? Because unlike them, she has principles. Kataji Brown Jackson served in leadership at Harvard. I think she was on the board. So as a result, she took no parts in uh, the Harvard decision, which is 21-207. But uh, those as you all are downloading and looking at the opinion, you will see that she wrote a concurring opinion only as to 21 um, dash, no, 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 20-1199 was the Harvard case. 20-207 was the North Carolina case, and she absolutely wrote a concurrence uh, as to that case. Because the Harvard case the, the, and the uh, North Carolina cases were written together by Roberts. But what Kataji Brown Jackson did, because she is a principal justice, she said, I'm not going to take part of the oral arguments or of the deliberations or of the decision in the Harvard case. But I have something to say about this issue as it relates to its application to the University of North Carolina. So that's what she did. That's what she did. She, uh, I, I suppose that you could, she could provide a model for Alito and Thomas, but you can't provide a model for criminals. They have their model. It's called stop us. Uh, so, uh, but you know, as they're still fumbling with their filings, there's an excellent um, article in the new issue of New York Magazine. I read it on the plane as I was coming down um, on Clarence and Jenny Thomas. I, I forget the title, it's called uh, Clarence and Jenny Thomas, A Love Story and the Implications for America. Or something. It's, it's great. It's great. Thumb in their nose at everything all the way. Onward, Christian soldiers. Uh, but yeah, Tanya Brown Jackson didn't have to recuse herself. If, if they had said, recuse yourself, all she had to do was point them to, what about them boys over there? They don't never, they don't never. And their friend that died in the hunting lodge. He was getting on them trips too. Yeah, Scalia. Yeah, he didn't. But, but she recused herself. She recused herself. So yeah, her, her, her concurrence in the North Carolina uh, pace, uh, case, only about 20 pages. And um, I admit, I, I started after I read the syllabus. And the syllabus in a, in a Supreme Court case is the summary at the beginning of the decision, which summarizes the facts of the case before the court, case or, case or cases in this instance, and then goes through the holding and then kind of gives you a brief summary of the explanation. And then they go into the longer explanation. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> I think that was a, I think I think probably that was actually a shot according to the author there uh, from People magazine. They did a shot a kind of photo spread of their love affair when he was around talking about pubic hairs on coke cans and harassing black women. They paired him up there so he could uh, kind of stitch his face together to the love of his life. Yes. Yeah. Who uh, how, kept him apparently what is that, how, how they saved one another, raged against their enemies and brought the American experiment to the brink. Oh my goodness. Um oh, and you all gonna love that. You're gonna let it all, Listen, all y'all talking about uh problematic white women. If y'all don't call her Jenny from this day forth, damn Come it, on. her name should be Jenny. Jenny. Look at the, face, the face of oppression. Woo. All right. Loving it. You gotta love it. I mean, prop, you know, it, it takes a lot of inbred self-hatred contempt apparently she was in a cult and then she got out of the cult and then was gotten to the cult of brainwashing people outside the cult anyway uh, i mean she, this 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 is the lady who wrote this article went down through the short hair she got everything on it but you know this whole thing where decades after your husband on the court and you running your policy through him you still calling anita hill can you imagine somebody calling your house oh uh, no <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish you would i wish you would I wish you and would. i don't and i don't change my number Come on, please call my. Can you imagine Anita Faye Hill? You better than both of us. <laughs> this woman calling your house talking about that. You should pray about it. <laughs> you better sip that drink. No, but um. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's 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 very important, I think, for us to understand. And we won't do a whole lot today. We kind of ease into this. I'm glad your mom called because I think two things. Can I, can I just say this? And I, and I think she no, called. I, 
you know, she grew up in Augusta, Georgia. Her mama couldn't vote. She couldn't vote at 18. And I think about, I think about all of the people in this country for whom this decision turns back the hands of time and it makes them scared. They're very scared about what it means to not have rights. We don't have voting rights now, affirmative action. And I think we were lulled into the sense of somehow all of the movements, including the election of Barack Obama, meant that the world has somehow changed. And we are being reminded, which is why I'm actually optimistic because we needed the reminder. It never went away. Those, those people in that beyond, uh, the, you know, without sanctuary book who had their children at the lynchings, uh, Dr. Black just sent me the uh, pickled penises that we were talking about a couple of Mondays ago. I was like horrified. But you think about those children's children's children are still here among us and a bunch of them voted for Trump. And Howard Stern okay. even said he, he, he despises y'all. The people who support him the most, he absolutely despises. And they're still going to show up to vote because their whiteness supersedes their health care, their teeth, their humanity and everything. Because the only thing they can hold on to that makes them whole. And that is scary because they're not going to let that go. So right. we have to make it so uncomfortable. And the only way that can happen is for us to be uncomfortable enough to know that we can't sit in this and just think, oh, well, we got we got Warnock in in Georgia. We don't have to show up next time. Up oh, Biden, I don't like him anyway, so I'm not voting this time. Up, oh, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Sides are the same. Like we we have to we have to be more uh, sophisticated than that, and also strategic and also warm. So I'm grateful. I think this keeps us warm. I agree. I agree. It keeps us warm. It does. And it keeps us warm in ways that transcend the specific importance of the decision. I think this is the point that we can't, well, we can, anything can happen, that we should work very hard not to miss. Uh, by the way, parenthetically, in terms of a footnote, uh, today's Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Thursday, June 29th edition, there's a front page article just above the fold, Georgia Medicaid expansion starts July 1st with the hillbilly racist uh, governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp. Um, it's like, oh, they, they expanded Medicare? I must have missed that. So when you read it, it says on July 1st, Georgia will make state history by opening Medicaid to thousands of student, uh, poor adults who live in the state, a step that state leaders once rebuffed as unthinkable. Oh, so the hillbillies are going to give some health care to the people who they duped into voting for them because, you know, they want to vote race first. OK, I said, but then the next sentence says, but most of the state's uninsured poor won't qualify. Wait, what? <laughs> So it continues and says, for more than a decade, Georgia has fought against adopting a full expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, as they call it, to ensure uh, you get your hands off my health care with that Obamacare. I mean, this whiteness has driven you crazy. To ensure the state's 400,000 or so poor adults with no health insurance, to insure rather. Now watch this. Instead, the state is opening its own limited expansion of Medicaid called Pathways to, Con to Coverage, which will require enrollees to work or do other specific activities. So these hillbillies want to get credit. We expanded Medicaid. No, you didn't. You could just say, take these hillbillies tax dollars and give it back to them in form of health. They are closing medical centers and hospitals all over this state. A lot of good friends in healthcare here, including one of the assistant deans right across down this way. And shout out to the uh, Hank and Billy a uh, Aaron Foundation, Billy Super Ayers, of course, uh, Aaron, still Haley Hardy here. They just uh, unveiled a statue of the hammer, Henry Aaron, about, about maybe, uh, maybe about 400 yards from where I'm sitting. Uh, and of course, a beautiful on the campus of the Morehouse School of Medicine, um, Dean. Um, Reba Kelsey was telling me about this, this expansion, trying to explain it to me, saying, you know, yeah, it's not a Medicaid expansion. They could just expand Medicaid. What these hillbillies want to do is look like they expanded Medicaid, and they get the headline in the AJC, Georgia Medicaid expansion. But when you read it, what you say is, no, they didn't create a separate thing to say you got to have work requirements for it. So 400,000 should be eligible, and what the paper says is maybe 100,000 will get it if they jump through all these hoops. It's very frustrating. Because, you know, there is a, an unhoused problem here in uh, Atlanta. As I walked 
downtown Atlanta yesterday and walked past the and went in for a while to the Auburn Avenue Research Library, a very important repository that at one time was the Negro Division of the Atlanta Public Libraries, uh, and then came out and kept going down uh, Auburn Avenue under the overpass where they ran the highway through black communities again um, and, and so forth. But but when you pass SCLC headquarters and all that historic Auburn Avenue, you know, there are people lying on the sidewalk asleep. People asking for money out of work. I mean, Brian Kemp and his hillbilly friends would say these are able bodied people who could work. But maybe you never knew about addiction, Governor Kemp. I mean, you're addicted to whiteness and to your own hillbilly logic. But I'm talking about addiction to crack cocaine, addiction to any form of drugs or alcohol. And just in the shadow, as I was getting ready to cross the street with Ebenezer Baptist Church on the right hand, right corner, and the uh, rest of King Park, including New Ebenezer on the left, a brother rode uh, up to me on a bike. And he says his birth name uh, speaks to the voice. Voice is his name. Maybe that's his name. I think it may have been his name because as we were talking, he said, you know, I'm a veteran. I'm currently unhoused. I had a six year struggle with cocaine, but I, I mean, I've been clean for six years now since the struggle. Just beyond the conversation we have on the corner, there's two brothers sleep in the parking lot. And just beyond them on the other corner, there's another John Calhoun park, not John C. Calhoun, I'm gonna talk about in a minute, the intellectual father of the Confederacy, but another John Calhoun, a black businessman in, in the sweet Auburn district. And there are brothers and sisters who are asleep in the park. I'm sitting here, standing here listening to Brother Voice, and he says, you know, my mother was a veteran too. I said, what branch? I said, Army, she was in military intelligence. I said, really? She said, yeah, she's a full, she, she retired a full bird colonel. I said, <laughs> and I thought about Charles Young. Professor Hunter, our people are beautiful people, aren't they? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is really think he know black people. You don't know nothing about us. <laughs> you don't know us Negroes, as Lord Neil Hurston said. Remember when we did that one? You don't know us Negroes. But and, go ahead. And, no, and beyond that, you know, that you and a lot of us take the time to see, mm -hmm. to look into the eyes, to, to be in community, to be with the humanity. It, it, we cannot also be infected with the same thing that the rest of the world is infected with. We have to see one another. We have That's to it. understand that they're before the grace of God. And I think, you know, not to get too high on your, on your high horse, because anything can happen. Anything can happen. Anything. And so if we're not there for each other. They definitely ain't gonna be there for us. So we we are all we have, right? We're all we have, Dr. Carr. So I, I thank you for modeling that. The brother in the Starbucks that you saved from getting arrested. I mean, we we're all we, we say have. Newbies. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, we we have to step in the gap, and 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 they every day are reminding us to not sit back and be silent and to no. to do nothing or to parrot the bull crap. You know, no I thank no you. No I thank you. We were, we were going to spend a lot of time with Charles Bloxham, which I think we should do next week, because, you know, as you were talking and, and over the course of three years and all of the books that people were um, expecting to see behind you every week, you know, that that came because you sat at the feet of a person. You already had your your desire to read but how to go hunt for books and how we should be, as we were talking about these bands all over the country, uh, you were talking about the shadow band being the real problem. Um, I think a lot of people don't even know where to start, you know, so I'm glad that we have this space. I'm glad that we have office hours in Nubia where we, you know, will dissect and go through books together and, and walk through books together. And there are several videos in narrative of us breaking down everyone from WB Du Bois to, um, I mean, you name it, we've, we've done just Blake. We've done a lot of the Zora Neale Hurston. We've done a lot of books uh, that we've walked through. Um, but I think that needs to be, as they try to block us from these, uh, higher learning spaces, we have our own. We have That's our right. own and we can lean That's in. Right. Well, um, well this, this is what we're going with. I know we're not going to take much time today. So, no, no, no. You, you got time. No, no. I think we should. I think like, you're right. We just, let's, 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 we'll grapple with blocks and I, I want to bring him in too. But, but today is just a bit of a taste because this SFFA versus Harvard in North Carolina is a provocation, as you say, if we can understand what we are looking at. John Harvard's plantation field university can burn to the ground forever. Won't change a thing in my life because I don't look to it for prestige. I don't look to it for recognition or accomplishment. I don't look to it even for the scraps of paper they've been able to afford as a result of the labor of my ancestors fueling the acquisition of the land that led to the damn place in the first place. The University of North Carolina could burn to the ground tomorrow. It would not change anything in my life. 
Not a damn thing. Do I wish for the burning down of the University of North Carolina and Harvard? No, because quite frankly, they don't occupy my mind one way or the other. I'm indifferent. Consider the cultural form of colorblindness or race neutrality. Consider it cultural neutrality in one way. You can't harm me. But the reason I chose coming here instead of Georgia State is because Georgia State and the Atlanta University Center have much in common beside the fact that there are a lot of black students in both places. They speak to a couple of different strategies for waging the struggle of African people in this country. Strategies that SFFA versus Harvard and SFFA, Students for Fair Admission versus the University of North Carolina, lay bare if we can pay attention. Atlanta itself speaks to these challenges. As I walk past the Odd Fellows building, an imposing building just beyond Big Bethel, Bethel Amy Church on the corner there. As I walk past the, the Prince Hall's Mason's Lodge, the funeral homes, the black funeral homes, Cox, right, cat a corner from Ebenezer Baptist Church. As I walk past the barbershops and the beauty parlors, the offices of the Atlanta Daily World, right next to the Dorch building, where the Dorch just having recently made transition, 100 black men of Atlanta, and saw the people outside those buildings sitting in folding chairs, some of them sitting on the curb, in and out of the little corner store. I went in the corner store to get a bottle of water when I spied the Mary Jane's Red Hots Lemon Heads. And now, later as I said, I must sample a few of these, if only for old times sake. <laughs> I thought about the stark differences in class in this city that, as you said, Professor Hunter, as we reread W.E.B. Du Bois, The Souls of Black Folk, the chapter he wrote on the hills of Atlanta, he said, Atlanta is a place that was built for greed. And some of that greed now looks like us. And as I walked further from the campus of Georgia State down Auburn Avenue and turned back to look and saw the looming skyscrapers in downtown Atlanta that have Georgia State University over them, having come from the student center and bookstore, all these beautiful gleaming buildings, everything, working the facilities here. And I had spent the day before on the, this campus in the university. And believe me, HBCU uh, uh, landscaping, chef's kiss the grass that like you play golf on it. I love it. I work at a school where they seem to have forgotten that form of fine art. But the fine art of, of landscaping at the Southern HBCUs can't be, can't be beat. But you know what, Clark, Atlanta, you know what Morehouse, you know what Spelman, you know what Morris Brown, you know what ITC doesn't have, that Georgia State has, all of that money. The Olympics came to this town. Andrew Young, who went to Howard University. Andrew Young, who spent countless hours at Pascal's, which is still up down the streets, no longer a hotel, but Clark Atlanta has it. They're going to renovate all that stuff as they get money. Andrew Young, who is so well known on this campus that it goes without saying, Andrew Young, uh, trustee at Morehouse, you know, Andrew Young, so forth. Andrew Young was the mayor of Atlanta when the Olympics came to this city in 1996. I almost feel like. I went to Morehouse and all I got was this stupid rec center and them t-shirts. <laughs> I went to <laughs> the Niagara Falls and I got with this stupid t-shirt. Now the baseball stadium that the Atlanta Braves eventually occupied, that was turned over. It's Georgia State's football stadium now. Georgia, uh, I think Georgia was Georgia Tech got the dormitories. Was it Georgia State? Georgia State. I mean, the largesse of all those billions that came into this city went to Georgia State and Georgia Tech. I thought, you could have transformed the whole Atlanta University Center, but what's your long game, baby? Now, I'm sure they're going to come back with all kinds of these discussions about municipal bond floating and the business community in Atlanta. I know the criminal enterprise called the business community in Atlanta. You go to downtown Atlanta, you can't miss it. The Walgreens, above the Walgreens is the big neon Coca-Cola sign. Why? Because the Woodruff family is names is on everything, including the major library for the Atlanta University Center, the Woodruff Library. But by the time uh, Robert Woodruff made transition, he had given a, almost a quarter billion dollars to Emory University. In fact, I kid my friends who teach at Emory. I say, y'all, y'all work at Coca-Cola University because uh, what's the name of that uh, that bank that is now Truist? Uh, B T and T was it merged with Sun Trust? Yeah. Well, before that, you see, Sun Trust it has its origins in. Candler family, the Woodruff family, 
They invested the Woodruffs and through their bank in what became Coca-Cola as Coca-Cola was flagging. Woodruff took it over, big promoter, marketer, it blew up bigger than God. And it's Coca-Cola. It's Coca-Cola tank. Delta Airlines, this kind of thing. And so when black political power came to the rise, how much of that largesse and resources was funneled into the black educational institutions and how much was funneled into these non-black institutions, which began to be increasingly black, at least Georgia State, speaking on Georgia Tech, the rambling wreck. But what you see is these are political strategies, points of entry. And so when you give that kind of money to a place like Emory, it enables someone like a Randall Burkett, a white book collector, a white bibliophile to get a blank checkbook and go to Swan auction galleries, having been trained in how to go and swoop down and buy everything moving at Harvard under Henry Louis Gates, him and Richard Newman and all the rest of them. And then you got a blank checkbook and you can outbid everybody. And now as you outbid people and collect things and then you go out and cultivate relationships with black people and you tell them, look, if you give your papers to Clark, they're going to be in a box in the basement. If you give them to Morehouse, some water may fall on them. They may fall out. They might even use them for toilet paper. But if you give them to Emory, come to Emory. I'm going to show you something. Let me unlock this door. In fact, I don't even have to unlock. I'm just wave my hand over the sensor and the door opens. And then what happens? You smell. What is that? Is that incense? Mm, is that something cooking? That reminds me. And then you hear, what's that? Oh, those black angels? What the hell? Wait a minute. I feel like people, am I being lifted off the ground? Is this anti-gravitational? Who is that? Is that my mother coming next to it? It's a hologram. But yeah, I'm giving my papers to you. And I'm telling all my friends, do so either. So when you look at Emory's collection and catalog, fueled by all that money, they've got one of the great collections of Africana in the world. And it's growing because they have the resources. When you look at the collections here, all my friends who are over there at Woodruff, who haven't been by the sea yet, I'm going by to see them before I leave town. John Henry Clark, Asa Hilliard, the papers there, because that's Clark's time when my books go to a black institution. Henry Gates has given books now over here. But I'm saying you can't compete in terms of resources. The closest maybe you get is something like a partnership between this university and those white schools, or this university, the uh, the, the Auburn Avenue Research Center's Library, as I said, and these, this is a battle for resources. When you read SFFA, why are people going to Harvard? They're going for the resources, which include the human resources, which is why glancing through, and now I'll get to do a line read, Kataji Brown Jackson's dissent, and Sonia Sotomayor's dissent. One of the things Kataji Brown Jackson brings up is, you know, you're saying you can't use race as a criteria for college admissions. Clarence Thomas and his, cons uh, dis uh, his, um, uh, his concurrence to the majority says you should not use race in any form or fashion. The majority is very quick to say, however, independent of Thomas, that this doesn't mean that you can't comment when you write your application on how race has impacted you positively or negatively, what you've learned from it, what you've been inspired by, this kind of thing. It doesn't mean you can't do that. But Kataji Brown Jackson asked during the oral arguments for North Carolina, not Harvard, because she, she unlike Thomas and Alito, has ethics and would not even participate in the oral arguments for the Harvard case, given her affiliation with Harvard, her formal affiliation. Kataji Brown Jackson asked at orals, she said, so are you telling me that if a student applies to the University of North Carolina, and says, I'm a fifth generation applicant. And if admitted, I would be a fifth generation attendee. And this is what the university has meant to me. And then somebody else applies and says, I am a first generation applicant because I was barred. My, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, my grandfather, my uncle, my auntie, my older brother were barred by race from attending the University of North Carolina. Are you telling me, Kataji Brown Jackson asks, in oral arguments, that those two things will be considered equally? That legacy, which you have not disqualified, will be allowed to continue to be factored in and why, at, but using race as an explanation for why you the first in your family to try to attend here will not be able to be used? The answers from the, uh, the, the, the lawyers were quite eloquent. They began with, uh, I sound like Tim Scott. I, 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 I. Point is this. As the media, the press, and unfortunately too many of my colleagues who law professors and lawyers are going to call this the end of affirmative action, what I choose to call it, the SFFF case, the holding is this. 
Standing for whiteness remains a central element in U.S. constitutional law. That is the precedent that was reaffirmed today in SFFA. Standing for whiteness. Standing, meaning whiteness still occupies force value and material benefit as a fundamental principle of United States constitutional law. Because we didn't get rid of legacy. Well, we'll tell you Negroes, you can't use race, but uh, Charles Walton Wellington the 15th will still be able to flex on his application to Harvard or Howard. Now, uh, Harvard or, um, or, or UNC. I'm gonna kind of tie some of these threads together. And we'll before, spend- before you do, let me ask you, um, admissions directors. Yes. Will they not be able to take into consideration? I mean, because it's it's really obje- it's objective. There's not it's not like um, mandatory sentencing with judges, right? They they have the opportunity, don't they, to make a determination that they want this university to be diverse, like Georgia State. Absolutely, absolutely. Georgia State, which has a black president, by the way. Right. So so could could they? Um, you know, now the onus is on this, these admissions directors and these universities to make sure that the people who make the decision take that into consideration. Is that, is that a, a counter? Are, are universities barred from considering people based on their race if they want to have a diverse student body? They are barred from formally considering race as a factor. Who would know? I'm, I'm just saying, like, how would you know? Well, you would know by, and this is, see, this is the trick. And this is where, unfortunately, all my friends who uh, are, are really falling in love with this idea that somehow they're going to trick 250 years of U.S. constitutional law by saying lineage instead of race, and ain't nobody going to see what they're doing. I can't wait for the white person to show up to say, my great, 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 grandfather was enslaved. Give me a check. And when these lineage Negroes show up and say, you can't get one, and then the court say, aha, we knew you were losing lineage as a proxy. Y'all so, I'm not even going to, I'm not attacking anybody. I'm just saying you should know something about the law before you start telling people how much you know about the law. But again, Twitter, you can't get all that a few characters, unless you get a blue check, at which point you reinforce the fact that this ain't even about us. But yes, they can use race. <laughs> you, yes, they can use race, but you can use race through experience. This is what Roberts, at least as far as I've read, is trying to reinforce. You can't say race is the criteria, but you can say how race impacted your life. And they can read that. And, and, and the admissions well, counselors well, are going to figure this Who is going to be overseeing, I like using that word, Yes. The admissions directors to make sure that they are compl- like, is there a checklist somewhere? Like, how how do you know if people? Because right now it's very racist. Like, how do we know who's who's complying and who's not? You have put your finger on again when you when I started reading Clarence Thomas's concurrence. This is what Thomas is raising. See, this ain't as easy as John Ricard used to say. In some stories, it ain't no good guys. You got to be real careful about this. In Thomas's concurrence, he's saying several things. He's saying you shouldn't use race for nothing. He says, and then he goes through, this is why he writes so much. I mean, he, but he's going through exposing what he thinks is the hypocrisy of how this thing has been used in affirmative action. I'll just say this very quickly, because again, we don't going to spend a lot of time there. He talks about how, uh, let me think, maybe Roberts, no, actually in the syllabus, Roberts talks about some of this, and then Clarence Thomas comes back and reinforces it. The idea that uh, when you have race, first of all, he said the 14th Amendment does not exclude Segregation. How do we know? Because they kept segregating after they passed the 14th Amendment. Katanji Brown Jackson's thing is, Katanji Brown Jackson's thing is, yeah, and they shouldn't have been doing it. They all agree on that. After the 14th Amendment passed, you're supposed to eliminate racial discrimination. The argument is on how you do it. So whether it be Thomas, whether it be Roberts, whether it be Sotomayor, whether it be Katanji Brown Jackson, everybody's saying after the 14th Amendment, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Clarence Thomas and them is like, yeah, whether it be, uh, 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 um, discriminated against people who are not white, get Woe versus Hawkins, for example, uh, whether it be um, in any area, employment, housing, you shouldn't have been discriminated. And interestingly enough, Clarence Thomas says in the area of interracial marriage, discrimination, you shouldn't, you should be able to marry who you want. Why? He's cleaning up that people, well, he did not really clean it up. He never was gonna get rid of interracial marriage, obviously, but people misread how to read uh, the Dobbs case last year. So now they can talk about interracial No, no, it's a different, different issue. But the point is this. What Clarence Thomas says is in this affirmative action stuff, and this goes back to the Adirondack case. We're not going to get into all this. And then, and then eventually the affirmative action case is Gruder, 
um, Bollinger, when race is used in a policy to see whether or not it violates the 14th Amendment, which says there should be equal protection under the law, the due process under the law, you can't discriminate based on race, this triggers something in statutory interpretation jurisprudence called strict scrutiny. You got to scrutinize the policy. And then it's got to meet two criteria. Number one, it's got to meet a compelling state interest. In other words, what is the interest of the government in enacting this policy? And then number two, if it does meet an interest, it must be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. This is if race is involved. Now, Clarence Thomas, if you when you read his uh, concurrence, and again, I haven't read the whole thing, I've just begun to read it. But the part I've read so far, he says, these, this Harvard and North Carolina plan fail all three of them things. First of all, is it strict enough? What is the compelling interest? Is it diversity? Uh, is it having a better, because you, you're saying Harvard, you're saying North Carolina, this is going to improve our society, it's going to create more leaders. He said, that's so incoherent. How is that going to cohere into a, a, a flock? Now I'm sitting in Atlanta. You can't look this way or that way without seeing black millionaires, black politicians, black, the same ones that approved Cop City a couple of weeks ago. I'm, listen, I'm reading Clarence Thomas with the class issue in my ear, because this is from a disgruntled Negro from Georgia. It's like, I had to fight every day. I had to fight. Looking at these bourgeois Negroes saying, is the interest leadership for all of us, or is this just for these Negroes? And you got all these kind of Africans, Africans from the Caribbean. Y'all hear you, Bitcoin. Carnell. I understand. Y'all anti-immigrant because you blaming some people who shouldn't be blamed, but at the same time, the same petty bourgeois Negroes from Nigeria are the same petty bourgeois why Negroes from Atlanta, they all got disdain for the black poor, but it's incoherent with what Clarence Thomas is saying. What is the compelling state interest? And he says, even if you satisfy that, is this narrowly tailored? He says, the way I'm reading these policies, you're measuring diversity by demographics. So whether you're a black daughter of a billionaire or the black daughter of somebody who couldn't hold a job or was addicted to drugs their whole life, whether you're the black son of somebody who was a full borough colonel and you messed up and got caught up on cocaine and now you're out on the streets of Atlanta, or whether you are the son of a, of a woman who never could hold a steady job in her life and y'all sold water ice on the streets of Philadelphia to get up the money for your college application. You're just looking at the number of people. You're not looking at the life stories. You're using demographics as a proxy for diversity. Clarence Thomas said, is that narrowly tailored? I don't even, this was the argument, damn it, that, that, mm, this is the argument Scalia was making when they argued, uh, uh, argue, argued Fisher versus Texas. And then, you know, he never got a chance to rule on it because he died in that hunting lodge that the billionaires were paying for. But the point is this, the admissions counselors are gonna do whatever calculus to keep this thing going. In fact, you can make the argument, in fact, this is what Roberts is saying as well, that when you eliminate race as a factor, guess whose numbers might go up? This is Ed Bloom and him in SFFA, the Asians. Why? Because if you're just going on GPA achievements and who was in junior merit, who got a 15.8 uh, million GPA, weighted GPA coming out of high school and five associate's degrees and they applying to Harvard, it's going if you look at that colorblind, you look and say, damn, there's more Asians got in, right? But then what's happening in the Asian community? Because guess what? Asian community is just a label. Is it the Chinese? Is it the Japanese? Is it the Koreans? Is it the Southeast Asian? Is it the Indians? This diversity thing the, that the opponents say is a sham and the proponents, when pressed, have to grapple with the class implications, which is why when it was hanging on affirmative action, the degree that it's been hanging on, it's been through the class lens. This is the Anthony Kennedy kind of stuff, right? At the end of the day, you gotta ask, what is the state interest? And so the one of the reasons I chose Atlanta to sit here for an hour and talk about this in this context with Charlie Bloxham, one of the most educated and brilliant brothers I've ever known, who taught me so much about book collecting. I came as a collector, but he, he enhanced and extended it in so many ways. Charlie Blackson's thing is, don't leave no books in the store. If you got $5, spend six and then give somebody back the dollar you borrowed and take it all. Why? Not because you're hoarding it for yourself, but because if you take it, you're guaranteed to give it out like he would give books to me to people who need them, like I give books to people. Well, you got five copies of that. Yeah, and I'm gonna get three of them away. One I'm gonna write in, the other one I'm gonna put on the shelf. But you gonna get a book because I bought that book because it was over there for two dollars and I had a 10 in my pocket. So I'm not gonna buy this one and three others. Why? This is the book, as opposed to these Negroes in these places like Emory, who got more money than God, and they want the book because Zona Hurston signed it. And then the graduate students come in like they were telling me at the uh, Auburn Island 
Auburn Avenue Research Library yesterday when I was standing in the archives having a conversation. They were saying, you know, what breaks our heart is that, you know, people come in here to work in the Andrew Young papers. They come in to work in the Herndon papers. They come in here to work in the Atlanta Student Movement papers we have and all of that stuff. And they are invariably overwhelmingly white. Why? Because these are the students at the Harvards and the Emory's and the University of North Carolina with the full fellowship. And when you get a black one in there, they're writing too. But then how is it benefiting us? That's why we jailbreaking. You can have Harvard. You can have UNC. You can have the AUC and Howard. We are here. Why? Because we are going to walk away from all of it. So that whether your child goes to Spelman or Georgia State, whether your child goes to Morehouse or Georgia Tech, whether your child goes to Emory or Morris Brown, their grounding will be here. The affirmative action argument in some ways evades the central issue, which is what is our objective? This is the governance question. What's our objective to get black political power so we could funnel billions from the Olympics into Georgia State instead of the AUC? Was our fight for black political power so we can get more police in Cop City and further separate the black bourgeois from the black mass? Was that our objective? Of course it wasn't our objective, but somehow it became increasingly conflated with our objective. And so the main people will be crying bloody murder about these cases are the Negroes trying to go to Harvard, trying to go to UNC. Should they be allowed to? Should they be able to? Should there be no bar? Absolutely without question. But my fundamental question is, why aren't you here? And not why aren't you here as a matter of demographics, why aren't you here as a matter of ideology? When Dr. King was killed, when his wake was held right over here in the chapel at Martin Luther King, I'm sorry, right, right over here in the chapel at Morehouse, when my friend and colleague uh, from Howard University, um, Brother Alfonso Campbell, an undergraduate at Alabama State University, stood as part of the color guard guard in ROTC over the body of Martin Luther King, right there on that yard that I'm pointing at. You know, that was a time when the students at the, at the Atlanta University Center came together and said, we want you to rename this campus the Martin Luther King University, but the schools could not cooperate, would not cooperate. It was unthinkable that they could come together. Can you imagine if they had done that then? Maybe Andrew Young and them, maybe Shirley Campbell and them, maybe, I mean, Bill Campbell and them, maybe, you know, Kasim Reed, maybe they can then flow a lot of that money over here instead of trying to buy pieces of this campus off and sell it so you can even have parking for the Mercedes Benz gone. Maybe they could have, maybe they couldn't have, but the failure of imagination, because our ideology has never been fully baked means that it becomes that much easier to just pick off a few Negroes, slot them in some Ivy League schools and say, this is progress. Clarence Thomas has a point, but his point is filtered through a blackness that is a figment of the white imagination. So the, the point that he could make in his kind of broke clock is right twice a day logic is subsumed by the pure self-hatred that he projects outward into his opinions. This is what Corey Robin in some ways gets at in his book, The, the Enigma of Clarence Thomas. But again, I don't want to get too, too deep in this today. I just want to kind of put this out because underneath this opinion is an opportunity for us to have this conversation, which is why we need the African framework. We understand in the social structure, there's an attempt to prevent any form of humanity to displace white supremacy, even if it means destroying the planet. <laughs> Today's New York Times prop as a footnote. The Earth's axis is shifting, and we're the reason. What? Uh, oh, damn. Groundwater pumping is a factor in altering the planet's spin. People are going under the Earth for so much water that the polar ice sheets, as global warming continues, and mountain, well, one thing is, of course, global warming, but quantities of groundwater pumped out of the ground for crops and households in the U.S., it's in the West. You know what's happening? This is what the New York Times says. It says, it says, I mean, for decades, scientists have been watching the average position in our planet's rotational axis, the imaginary rod around which it turns, gently wander south, away from the geographic North Pole and towards Canada. Suddenly, though, it made a sharp turn and started heading east. First, they think it's global warming, the glaciers are melting, but now they discovered another thing. Wow, Ki Wan So, who led the research behind the latest discovery, recalled thinking when his calculations showed a strong link between groundwater extraction and the drifting of the Earth's axis. 
It was a big surprise, said Dr. So, a geophysicist at Seoul Master University. Why am I bringing this up? For this reason, as we can't get our act together to talk about what we want and that what we has been driven not only by liberation for African people in the criminal enterprises of settler colonies of the West, but and African people on the continent, but for humanity, because we are now literally talking about we need to set the world right side up. Yeah, yeah fool. You know what y'all are doing now? You about to mess around and the ball getting ready to wobble us off this thing. Wobble, baby, wobble, baby, wobble. This is bigger than just racial equity. This is bigger than diversity. This is talking about the survival of the species. But while we are increasingly focusing on how as individuals we can advance in this system, which is one reason you want to go to Harvard, maybe reason one through 10, and maybe 11 is I want to help humanity, even though in your application you, you said it was all about your humanity. This decision, if we take it carefully, provides us an opportunity to rethink our values. As Adolf Caesar told the actor, both in the stage play, uh, a soldier's play, as we talked about with Charles Fuller, or the movie, CJ, the race can't afford you no more. <laughs> At the end of the day, these people don't want y'all. And guess what? You should ask yourself why you want them to want you so much. Should you ever get into Harvard? Absolutely. Should you ever get to North Carolina? Sure. Should you go? Absolutely. But you should ask yourself, what is it you're trying to get there that not only can't you get here, but more importantly, you can't get at home and in your community. So when you, when you go to the AUC or go to Harvard or UNC, you're not going there looking for your humanity or looking to be validated or, or somehow, somehow created as some kind of figment of somebody else's imagination. So I just want to say a couple of other things and we can kind of, you know, pause for today, for now. Because we understand that there's a logic to this. And by a logic to it, I mean a logic to when they're releasing these opinions. By the time the folk on YouTube see this, we'll get the one that people should be really worried about now. And before I say that, and that's the 303 case, Linus, the, the First Amendment case. John Roberts loves the First Amendment. He uses it as a battering ram. This is the one about the web designer and whether or not they have to serve gay and lesbian folk or whether they can call upon the First Amendment and say you're restricting my freedom of speech. They saved it for last. So it wasn't affirmative action. It's the First Amendment that they're waiting on. And as people start narrating everything that happened before the SFFA case as victories, yeah, they were victories, but understand that what was at stake was the legitimacy of the court. So when you saw them uh, sell out Alito and Thomas on the independent state legislature, uh, theory, the Moore case out of North Carolina, people say, that was a victory. Yeah, it was a victory. Number one, as a matter of real politics, they didn't need it anymore because they flipped the North Carolina Supreme Court and they were able to keep those gerrymandered maps. But more importantly, the reason they backed up off the independent state legislature theory, and by that I mean the three political ops on the court that you named, Comey Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Roberts, who were all in Florida during Bush versus Gore, on different sides of the issue with Republican ops, because they understand that this is a political question. It should never been before the court. It's very clear that in the Constitution, when they say legislature, they mean the lawmaking apparatus in the state, not just literally the state legislature. It shouldn't even been an issue. And Roberts, when you read the opinion, basically says that. But the reason he's over there and got Kavanaugh and Comey to come, uh, Comey Barrett to come with him, because they know if y'all went that, it's, it's full out war at this point. You've destroyed the apparatus. You've basically given these people what they've been trying to get since John C. Calhoun articulated a philosophy of what the United States could be in November 1845 that I just spent time reading a plaque in downtown Atlanta on the building where they started SunTrust Bank, which means, of course, partners with Coca-Cola to create the kind of money that you can give the Emory a quarter billion dollars and more and counting and sprinkle a couple of pennies to places like the AUC, the name their library for you. That was their vision from the beginning. The challenge we have is to imagine the type of world we want to live in and then work very deliberately to recover the momentum of memory for how we've made progress toward that world, whether it be Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, whether it be the black districts of Detroit and Cleveland and Newark, whether it be the black districts in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma or Dallas, Texas, to imagine the world we want to live in and then move toward it. But we've gotten so bereft of our memory that when we say we want something, 
We haven't really stopped to consider A, whenever we made progress toward it, B, what we're really talking about in this context, and C, how do it free us, not individuals, but us as a group? Not us as everybody in the links, not us as everybody who's an alpha, not us everybody who's in Sigma Pi Phi, not us everybody who managed to get on the corporate board, but literally all of us. Prof, I, I, we've gone over an hour and I, you know, we wanted to keep it a little tight. I, I, no, 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 no time. No, 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 I don't, because, because part of it is, I, you know, I want to have a chance to, to really read this and read it in the spirit and in the, the, the arc of a man like Charles Bloxon. Um, because he, let me just say, say this again. This is very quickly again, because I'm, I'm, some of you think I'm all over the place, but in my mind is cooking. One of the first things I did when I got off the plane, went over to the uh, Morehouse bookstore to see what else they were deaccessioning that I could take back. And, uh, you know, I bring my writing elements, but I bought a little $2 spiral notebook and was determined that for the few days I'm in Atlanta, I'm just going to fill this up with writing. So when we get off here, I'm going to go over there in that yard and write, continue to write. I went to the King Chapel. Bob Jeremiah, I saw your, your portrait for the first time in person. They unveiled a beautiful uh, oil portrait of Jeremiah Wright, right next to Ava Carruthers on the second floor, right above the floor where Dr. King's portrait is. They got all these portraits of famous and prominent African people in the in the King Chapel, and now Jeremiah Wright has joined them. So but I, mean, I had to go over there and see that. But I'm going to spend time writing because as we continue through this summer, one of the great values and strengths of us being together like this week after week after week is an opportunity to slow things down and to think. And as we prepare to go some of these places together physically, so it ain't just me, maybe next summer, you know, we'll see maybe some places before then. But like I said a few months ago, Prof, when we were talking about that, and you know, you trying to help, help us get it together for this summer. And of course, that's on me. I said, you know, but I'm going to get out so we can kind of preview what it looked like when we all go in some of these domestic study abroad. So that's what I've been doing. And here's just another one. Um, but I want to I end with this. The affirmative action debate, argument, case, the decision isn't just about the issues that are in the decision. Diversity, opportunity, all the language we've been socialized in this social structure to use as proxies for our liberation, which aren't proxies at all for our liberation. But it also gives us an opportunity like your mom reaching out to you and having a conversation, like all the conversations we're going to have now, while people are banging pots and sounding the alarm bell for places that most of us will never go and should never hold as the definition of our aspirations. It would be much more important to go to the King Center and donate because when Coretta started this, uh, our ancestor Coretta Scott King started this in the wake of her husband's assassination. She reached out to a brother who was on the faculty of the English department right here at Bellman, the great Vincent Harding. And when we read in Nubia, there is a river, pieces from that. We were talking about the governance formation in our African states framework. We were doing the class, the first iteration of the class, second one coming. She reached out to him and when he couldn't realize the broad vision beyond even nonviolence of this center where blackness could be used as a foundation to speak to the world and transform the world he withdrew from the king center came back to this part of town and opened a small unit here on this campus right across the street here called the institute of the black world in some ways that's what narrative is it is an extension, it is a version, it is a complication and remix of the Institute of the Black World. And in our baby steps, we are providing, in conversation with each other, the foundation for the thing Vincent Harding had in his mind when Coretta Scott King came to him in 1968 and said, would you leave the campus of the Atlanta University Center where the kids are clamoring for y'all to come together as one school and come down the street and help me start the King Center. Things will keep if the momentum of memory threads through. But understand, and I will end, I really will end because I, I talked about that Calhoun plaque. Like there's a Calhoun Park, John Calhoun Park on Auburn Avenue named for a black businessman in that incredible black district that they call Sweet Auburn. John C. Calhoun 
as we should say, not to be confused with the architect, the white architect of the Confederacy, right there where they got the Sun Trucks bank marker, right across from the Coca-Cola sign with all that Woodruff and Candle money, is a plaque affixed to a time capsule from decades later, I think 1972, centuries later, that contains an excerpt from a speech by John C. Calhoun delivered November the 13th, 1845. And I want to end with that excerpt. Because as I stood there and watched and looked at this, I just shook my head. This guy's a Confederate. This guy's the intellectual architect of the Confederacy. He's also the architect when he was the senator from South Carolina of the filibuster. The precedents that can be swept away, as we see with Supreme Court jurisprudence these days. He articulated a vision of greed and white supremacy that put Atlanta at the center of the project. I ain't just talking about of the South. I ain't just talking about of the Confederacy. I'm talking about of the country. And in many ways, what he said is what Du Bois is talking about in Souls of Black Folk when he says Atlanta is the place where greed comes together. Remember that Du Bois said Atlanta's where all the railroads meet up. And here at the Nexus, it's like that uh, that uh, Ch Athena chasing them golden apples that, are, that he's dropping. They, they're going for greed. And as they go for greed, they're passing humanity. John C. Calhoun says this, such is the formation of the country between the Mississippi Valley and the southern Atlantic coast, from the course of the Tennessee, Cumberland, and Alabama rivers, and the termination of various chains of the Allegheny Mountains, that all the railroads which had been projected or com uh, commenced, he says, although each has looked only to its local interest, must necessarily unite to a point in DeKalb County in the state of Georgia called Atlanta, not far from a village of Decatur, so as to constitute one entire system of roads having a mutual interest in each other instead of isolated rival roads. This is November 1845. This is 15 years before they secede from the Union. This is before Dred Scott. This is before the South increasingly says, you people in the North don't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, through, the, uh, through the hemisphere, he goes on and says, if you do that, at that point, the Charleston and Savannah roads, each aiming at a connection with the great Mississippi Valley, meet. And from that point, the state of Georgia is uh, engaged in constructing a railroad to terminate at Chattanooga on the Tennessee River above the Suck, which passes south of the western terminus of that chain of the Alleghenies, which throws the water on the one side into the Mississippi and on the other into the Atlantic. He is articulating a vision of the United States anchored in the South and this train switching place called Atlanta that is purebred white supremacy. He goes on with this truck, the road from Memphis. What? To LaGrange will be met with the Decatur Railroad around the Muscle Shoals at Tuscumbia in Alabama and the uh, extension of that road to the Georgia trunk near Rome with the same trunk, the road projected from Nashville. Come on. We'll meet at Chattanooga and the Knoxville and Hiawassee already graded will fall in with it at a point not far from Rome. Three more paragraphs. He says, so if we turn south from Memphis to the railroad from Vicksburg to Jackson, come on, water crisis and the projected roads from Glen Gulf and Natchez. It will be seen by reference to the map that they must all unite in their eastern extension at some point on the ridge between the Mississippi and Tom Bigby and thence in their extension toward the South Atlantic ports. Must necessarily unite with the railroad now partially completed between Montgomery on the Alabama and West Point on the Apicheola and unite at the same place with the Charleston and Savannah, Clarence Thomas, roads and the Georgia trunk. So again, the short railroad from New Orleans to Lake Pontchartrain, uh oh, watch out, New Orleans, leads by navigation through Lake Pontchartrain to Mobile and thence by the Alabama to Montgomery. To the same point, the projected railroad from the Pensacola, watch out Florida, be through the Montgomery Railroad. Last paragraph, if we cast our eyes further to the Northeast. Wait, what? Wait, what? If we cast our eyes further to the Northeast, we will find that the projected railroad from Richmond to Kanawha or the Ohio in its Southwestern branch 
must necessarily pass through Abington, down the valley of the Holstein to Knoxville, and thence to the same point in whole, thus constituting from the remarkable formation of the country one entire system of roads uniting at a great central point through which the whole have a common interest each in their completion of the other, each increasing its particular prosperity from the prosperity of the whole. John C. Calhoun, purebred racist, architect of the Confederacy, articulating the same damn vision of America that your open enemies continue to do to this day. How do it free us? It was never intended to free us. And instead of creating a system that can dismantle the one that oppresses all of us, regardless of color or background, and come together on a different thing, we trying to figure out how we can buy our way into the place where we can become some of the people that manage the system that John C. Calhoun was had a vision of running through the city I'm sitting in right now. If that's diversity, you can have it along with the damn decision. Thank you. Um, and, and as you were talking, right, um, the, the Harvard case was brought primarily by an uh, to support an Asian young man who said he couldn't get in because black people got in. And I think about listening to Gina Yashere, the uh, Nigerian comedian, uh, her book called Cack Handed, Cack Handed. And she's talking <laughs> about, you know, the immigration into into of course, Great Britain, but also kind of the philosophy of coming in as an immigrant, right, to to these lands uh, with a purpose and a plan. And there's no coincidence, you know, like community wise. And I often ask this question because we have been so brainwashed into wanting to be part of a system that has never wanted us, that only wanted our labor, only wanted our, our rhythm and none of our blues, only wanted to use us and, and build mm -hmm. upon our backs and our and our genius, right? I mm -hmm. often ask, you know, where these organizations, we have so many of them. Why aren't each of them committed to one thing that we can dominate? Why aren't each of them, you know, putting forth like how these kids are getting into these schools because they have study groups. It's why they dominate the spelling bee. It's it's systems that they've built around stuff. Even golf. If we look at the South, the, the Koreans in golf, it is a system. If you look at what they're doing, they are committed to knowing how, what are the rules here? Okay, let's put a farm together and let's dominate that's because right. this is a pathway to money, wealth, success, whatever it is. Yeah. But, you know, we we are all over the place, all at once, everywhere, everything, you know. At the same time, we are the seed. At the same time, we are, we are the roots. At the same time, we are the foundation. None of this happens without us. So it, right. it, it is incumbent upon us to take time and focus, not allow, allow our stolen focus to happen. I'm recommending that book for everybody. Yes. Please. Please. Stolen focus. Please. And then let's individually and then as a community in our little groups churches wherever you are let's figure out what can we dominate right because we can we can because we can oh but i should mention shout out to my all modern tennessee state i saw you saw the news i saw president glover there these negroes got a hockey team i know yes tennessee state announced a hockey team earlier this week and i'm saying okay now as long as you ain't stocking it with white folk we don't need no affirmative action can you imagine them we got we got we got gymnastics you know, yeah, exactly. We got the sisters doing gym up Jefferson Street at Fisk. We got the brothers doing hockey down at Tennessee. It isn't because, like you said, we're not just doing that to get in. We're doing that because we demonstrate it's anything we choose to do, we can do. You know this better than I ever will. Sports is a metaphor for social relations. We don't look at black achievement in sports as just individual triumph. It's reminding us that well, hold on. This is the thing. You throw the ball in there. Shit, I can do that better than anybody. Now, give me the book. I can do this better than anybody. It's a metaphor. You're right, bro. Why can't we have to work together? This is the un this is the pro this is the unrealized vision of the Atlanta University Center when Dr. King was killing them kids. Said, why can't we just make this one school? But guess what? While we working on that, we got narrative. Come we on. have to wait. <laughs> but, but even even those being individual schools, each of them should be committed to one thing that they dominate. Like, yeah. and then come together, and then come together. I mean, it's just, oh, it's right here. It's right, it's here. right here. And again, I feel like they did us a favor. They did. If we're paying attention. They um, always did. And uh, and I'm so grateful to have this space because it wouldn't have happened without that day, um, right before the pandemic on Veterans Day that Adwa brought you up there, and I you looked at me like. You you could say these things. I was like, 
Yes, because which is what you do. We was listening, listening to you yesterday and this morning, right? It's serious. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, so, I mean, thing. I, I was I was talking to Dr. Robin yesterday, and I was like, so many people say you're, you're you know, I'm courageous, and I'm like, the truth should never be courageous. It should be the truth, and everyone should feel compelled to say it, you know, and say it plainly. I heard we're you parse words and bend ourselves and fold it and not worry about. No, listen, it's it's the truth. Is it the truth? Then let's say it. Let's say it. Yes. Let's say it boldly and proudly and empower everybody around us to say it. And if you don't like it. Uh, Fix yourself, you know, fix, fix yourself. But let's go. We got we got too much work to do. We got too much work to do. And I, you know, I know we can party and BS, but I think we over-index in that. We do of that. Of course right. we do. Of course we do. But I tell you what, and, and you know, these kids down here can party with the best of them. But I'm telling you, Prof, when I see these children, I saw some this morning when I was walking over here. These young children on these on these tours. And you know, it's something about our protocol. I'm hearing this in my mind now. These ways of knowing and our culture meaning making. I'm standing at the bus stop just reading. I'm reading. And Student after student passing me. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How you doing, brother? I mean, the police, campus police, how y'all doing? All these sisters and brothers, they like, hey, the South is where Africa went for safekeeping. Please understand the protocol. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't yeah. happen to me, even in DC and in Baltimore, although I'm getting stopped all the time. A uh, sister who said, and by the way, I'll tell you, sister, I hope your husband continues to recover. I was at the, coming from Randall Robinson's memorial on Saturday, and a sister stopped and, and expressed uh, the fact that they never miss us having conversations on Saturday. And her husband had had a stroke, and he's sitting in the rehab. He said, he don't miss a minute. You don't come in there on Saturday morning. <laughs> so I'm just saying, we have to keep. Let's tell that truth to each other first. We owe it to each other to tell that yeah. truth first. Yeah. And and what the devil meant for evil, come on, you know, you know, God can turn it around. God turn can it around. Turn it around. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's I am. Go. Uh, thank you for you know tapping in uh, on, on an off day. Uh, no, it's no off day. It's no off day. In fact, as you as we winding up, I'm gonna okay. take us up here. All right, let's, let's go. See. This is uh, of course, you see, there's uh. Them sitting in Sale Hall. There's Martin Luther King walking to his graduation. And I'll go here. You see the yard. This is, of course, this is where Spike Lee, uh, they rang the bell for school days, of course. You see the, the grave site there. That, of course, is where Benjamin and Sadie Mays are buried in Sale Hall behind them. In that direction is Clark Atlanta. And you come over here to the other side. You see how small this place is, mm -hmm. really. But it's intimate. It's intimate, though. It's very, as you know, it's very, and that's what you need. Over here, of course, the Howard Thurman, uh, he and City Mays are buried over there. You can bury. Oh, no. All right. So I guess uh, internet went out, Dr. Carr. All right. On that note, anybody in the Atlanta area, go take yourself over there and go on tour. In the meantime, I want to say thank you. I, hey, it's popping back in. Okay. Dr. Carr, Here you back? Go. All right, there you yeah, go. I'm back. All right. There, the great Benjamin Elijah Mays going to graduation, being led in by Adam Clayton Powell. They're going to give him an honorary degree. Please understand, our people, this is what we do. This is what we do. So thank you. You know, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I'm breathing, we're going to do a lot more of this. We're going to be in conversation with our people because we jailbreak it. Yes. Sir. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> love you too. Love you too, everyone. Talk to y'all on Monday, office hours. Happy whatever y'all yep. doing this weekend. See, I'll see some of you in Chicago at Fools Word on the street is you going to the shy. Yeah, yeah, I'm going. I'll be in the shy. I'll be in the shy. Uh, I might even get to catch Anita Baker. I'm not sure. Andy oh. Porter. Andy Porter is going to be on the show today to talk more affirmative action. So thank you for you that. Got, you got Angie. Yeah, I got Angie. While we were talking, I was like, let me let me get Angie Porter you know on here. That's Thanks. who you want. You want the expert. Get, yes. get the legal mind on it. That's going to yes. be that. I'm like, I'm I'll like, yes. Business. Yes. So I thank you. I thank you for all of the greatness that you've poured into us, Dr. Carr. And Nubians as well. Thank Love you. Love you all. All right. You. All right. See everyone in them streets.